Good evening, everyone. And thank you for being with us here tonight at this very important information evening. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Therese Manns and I'm the General Manager at North Sydney Council. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, please take a moment to switch your phones on silent, if you could. For your convenience, bathrooms are located in the foyer. And in the unlikely event of an emergency, please kindly follow the instructions provided by venue staff. Your elected council at North Sydney has a strong focus on community involvement and participation. Participation in decision making. And tonight I would like to acknowledge that joining us is North Sydney Mayor, Councillor Zoe Baker, Councillors Shannon Welsh, and Godfrey Santa. I would also like to acknowledge Council's Director of Planning and Environment, Marcelo Acciuzzi, and Acting Manager of Strategic Planning, Neil McCurry. Having been with Council for just over 12 months now, I never cease to be amazed by the strong engagement and considered representation and contribution of the residents here in North Sydney Council. And I congratulate you on this. Tonight's agenda, is centred around an information session on the State Government's housing reform proposals. The session will be led by Mayor Zoe Baker and presented by Council's strategic planning team. We hope the opportunity tonight to hear from Council's planning team will assist you in gaining a better understanding of the proposals and assist you in consideration and response. Following the presentation, we will hold a question and answer session and questions can be submitted using the QR code on the screen. <laughs> okay, <laughs> on the screen shortly. <laughs> questions can be submitted, uh, so questions can be submitted through the QR code. I encourage you to send your questions through as they come to mind throughout the presentation. You don't have to wait till the question and answer session to do that. Uh, the QR code will be displayed again later in the evening if you do miss it at the start. Uh, it's very simple to submit your question. Uh, there's no need to download an app. You just scan the QR code and follow the browser prompts. And if you're having any trouble, then please ask the person next to you. Um, and in the interim, we might, I might just um, move up and down um, just to see if I can help you if you are having trouble. But without further ado, I would like to welcome Councillor Zoe Baker, Mayor of North Sydney Council, to the stage to commence tonight's presentation and do the acknowledgement of country. Thank you. There's the QR code. <laughs> Good evening and welcome. Um, on behalf of all those present, I acknowledge and extend our gratitude to the Kamaragal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet, and in the spirit of reconciliation, we honour and respect their elders past, present and emerging, and their deep connection and custodianship of the land, waterways and skies. So, the State Government rightly is committed to addressing the worst housing affordability and rental crisis since the immediate post-World War II period. The housing crisis is many decades in the making and the causes are complex. The solutions will also be complex and will involve all levels of government. Our community and council recognise that and we are committed to pitching in by prioritising affordable housing and planning for growth. On the 28th of November 2023, Planning Minister Paul Scully announced the low to mid-rise housing reforms and he said, quote, density done well means townhouses, apartments and terraces clustered near shops and high streets and parks. We already have great examples of these types of homes. Sydney has grown using these housing types. Look at homes in Wollstonecraft, Waverton, Erskineville, parts of Wollongong and Newcastle. They're great places to live. We just need more of them. There is a reason that the Minister cited 
Wollstonecraft and Waverton as good examples of density. Our local government area is one of the three most densely populated areas in New South Wales. 89% of our housing stock is medium to high, high density. Yet we have the lowest levels of open space and recreational facilities in Northern Sydney and lower than that in the City of Sydney. Since 2011, the residential population of the North Sydney local government area has grown by 6,600 people, including 2,000 more school-aged children and 3,000 seniors. Since 1987, well over 2,000 boarding rooms, house rooms have been lost from our local government area. And there has been a similar erosion of low um, of affordable rental units in that since that time. Yet whilst more than 4,000 new dwellings have been constructed over the last decade to accommodate growth, average housing and rental prices are at record highs. Council and our community together have been planning for growth for decades. Council's approach has been always to concentrate residential density in and around existing centres and transport no nodes, including the new metro sites. Under Council's existing plans, the residential population of North Sydney is expected to increase by 19,500 people or 27% above the existing population over the next 20 years. More than 6,000 new dwellings have already been planned in the St Leonard's 2036 plan area alone, centering around the Crow's Nest Metro site. The delivery of additional housing must be accompanied by increased capacity in essential utilities such as sewerage, water, electricity, NBN, as well as community and social infrastructure to serve existing and future populations. That's open space, schools, hospital beds, aged care and sporting facilities. The fact is that local um, place-based planning in partnership with local communities delivers great outcomes. That's not just a slogan, that is a lived experience here in North Sydney. People will accept radical change, even when the changes impact their amenity, if they are given a voice and been part of that planning process. So the best example of this for me is the experience in Crow's Nest St Leonard's. Um, in 2011, and since, Council um, commenced a series of planning studies and the purpose of that was to increase the density around the transport hubs at St Leonard Station and the new um, Metro, but also to ensure that public benefits were delivered to meet that additional height and, and, and density. Um, for the first planning study, more than 900 people made submissions, individual submissions, and after the first study was adopted, um, the planning proposals began to come in with greater height and density and um, they came before council. And at the first meeting of the first planning proposal under that first St Leonard's Crow's Nest planning study. It was for a residential flat building in Albany Street. And I will never forget that a registered speaker came to speak for, on behalf of an owner's corporation of an adjoining, a neighbouring residential flat building. And he described how the proposal would have devastating impacts on the views of that building and even on his own uh, unit. And one would expect that he would then urge the council to not proceed with that increase in density and height, but instead the opposite happened. He urged council to support the rezoning because it was consistent with the excellent place-based planning and because they, he understood, and the community did, the need for more housing, but they supported the public benefits that would be delivered from contributions to the fund, ex the expanded Hume Street Park and improved public domain works. So the building now stands in Albany Street as part of a series of, new, of residential flat buildings that are part of the planned revitalisation that is happening in Crow's Nest. So council met on Monday night to consider the, um, the reforms and the message that the council put is essentially this. Trust local government and local communities to plan for additional density. Work with councils and communities to allow changes tailored to local conditions and not a blanket one-size-fit-all approach. Back good planning principles and allow communities to deliver density done well. 
So it is now my pleasure to introduce council. And, and before I do, I'll just say this. Um, one of the ways to negotiate with the state government successfully on these things and to ensure that that essential community infrastructure can be delivered um, is to start with good evidence-based planning. And one of the strengths of our council and our community is we're not running frivolous arguments, um, but we're backed by extraordinary um, expertise and experience in council's strategic plan in council's director of planning and strategic planning department. Um, um, and so, without further ado, I call on Council's Director of Planning and Environment, Marcelo Ocuzzi, um, and the Acting Manager of Strategic Planning, Neil McGarry, to present the facts on the proposed changes and the likely impacts on our local government area. If you'd please welcome them. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor Baker. My name is Marcelo Acuzzi and I'm the Director of uh, Planning and Environment here at North Sydney Council. Uh, I also like to acknowledge that tonight we meet on Camaragal land. Uh, the Mayor did a pretty good job of uh, introducing these changes uh, and Neil and I will, will try to unpack uh, these uh, changes, these proposed changes, in a little bit more detail for you. And our job tonight is to try and ensure that you walk out of here with enough information uh, to understand what's being proposed uh, and to enable you, if you so desire, to, uh, to make a submission. Um, so, what we'll cover tonight. So, I'll speak briefly about how we manage change at the moment. Change is inevitable. Sydney's been growing uh, since the British landed here in 1788 uh, and it's not going to stop growing any time soon. Um, so, I'll talk briefly about that, although the Mayor's done a pretty good job already. Um, then we'll talk about the, the, the policy changes being proposed. Um, and they are broken up into two parts, uh, and they are a little conflated in the media, but uh, the low and mid-rise housing proposals, which talk about the two to six storey uh, increases across the board, uh, and the transport-oriented development program. So they're two separate things, as I say, conflated in some uh, media outlets. They're split into two parts, which I'll talk about in a moment. And Neil will take us through uh, what some of the key impacts we think will arise from these proposals uh, and some of the issues that we think are relevant. So how do we do planning and how do we manage growth at the moment? Managing growth is one of the most important things that established areas like North Sydney uh, Council do. Uh, and it's always under the umbrella, always under the, the I suppose, the the keen eye of the state government. Um, the New South Wales government, since I think the first plan back in 1951, uh, the County of Cumberland plan, has set a direction for local government. Um, and since 1951, there's been a series of plans that have been rolled out by the state government. The most recent one, uh, which was developed by the now defunct uh, Greater Cities Commission, uh, is a metropolis of three cities. That's the broad blueprint for the growth of Sydney. Uh, sitting just underneath that uh, is the North District Plan, uh, and it covers this whole northern region, of which we're obviously a part, and nine or 10 other local government areas uh, are part of that North District Plan as well. Uh, and one part of those plans that people tend to go to very quickly, certainly planners do, is what the housing targets are in those plans and what the jobs targets are are in those plans. In this particular plan, for example, the target for North Sydney was 3,000 dwellings over five years. So the approval, not the delivery, the approval of 3,000 additional dwellings over uh, five years, so two, 2016 to 2021. So those broad plans uh, then need to be landed, need to be implemented at the local level and, and North Sydney Council, like all other councils uh, in the Sydney metropolitan area, uh, are responsible for doing that. Uh, we prepare what uh, was introduced a few years ago, the, the local strategic planning statement, uh, which is our interpretation of the broad strategic direction delivered by the state government and how we will implement that uh, at the local level. Um, it's, it has a very strong planning focus and you can, you can look at that document uh, online, it's available. Um, and a subset of that is the local housing strategy. So, so how will we deliver 3,000 dwellings in five years and beyond? Um, so as the Mayor pointed out, the, 
the, the, the local housing strategy, which is adopted by the council in 2019, uh, includes uh, some details there about how we will go about doing that. And fundamentally, uh, it's, it's a little bit in three tranches. The first one is to rely on the existing zoning regime. We have lots of capacity within uh, our local government area through the existing zoning controls, which have been around for a long, long time, decades in some cases, in most cases. Um, that's the first tranche. The second tranche is a heavily planned precinct being the St. Leonard's and Crow's Nest precinct, which started work back by council in about 2010, 2011, and finally overtaken by the state government uh, in 2020, I think it was. So we do have plans and we don't shirk uh, our responsibility as, as a member of the wider metropolitan area uh, to deliver our fair share of housing growth. Uh, and I think in the media you've heard recently that there is kind of this, these battle lines, uh, I think unfairly been drawn, that, that local government is resisting growth. Uh, and that's simply not the case, certainly not in North Sydney. So out of, that, out of those uh, broad strategies, we, we, as the Mayor pointed out, we, we, we do uh, place-based planning. We go in and we, we interrogate uh, areas. We understand what makes up the character of the area, the significance of heritage, if, if it's relevant, the, 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 the access networks, um, overshadowing, livability, these sorts of things. And we consult on what we find and we consult again to refine. Um, and these plans take some time, um, as some of you no doubt have been involved in some of those uh, planning uh, works. And, and this council prides itself quite rightly, I think, on on the way that it does consultation. It's, it's genuine consultation and, and changes uh, are taken on board. I think um, the council adopted the, the Neutral Bay Town Centre Planning Study, for example, um, just on Monday night. Uh, and that was a result of a lot of, a lot of conversation, a lot of uh, planning work um, that resulted in, in some reasonably significant change um, for the future of that town centre. Um, and so that leads on, on then after all that exploration, after all those conversations and engagement with the local community and consult work and other technical studies are done, it, it results ultimately in, in amendments to the planning controls with, which then lead to the lodgement of, of development applications. So I just wanted to point that out as a context setter for how these changes that Neil will take you through in some detail, how these have been proposed as opposed to how we've been doing change. And again, uh, change that is sometimes difficult and I sit in council meetings and, and see that the councillors are, are being asked to make some difficult decisions and sometimes it's, it's somewhat contrary to some elements of community vibe, but there, there is uh, an overwhelming desire to, to do good planning uh, that responds to, to local places and acknowledges the, the, the things that make those places important. So, the, um, as I said, the, the, the changes being proposed by the state government are broadly uh, split into two parts, and Neil will talk about these in more detail. But the, the first one is uh, an explanation of intended effects. It's a little bit of jargon, but it's almost a discussion paper, and this uh, document will apply, proposed to apply right across the board between Newcastle, Wollongong, and the Blue Mountains, and everywhere in between. Uh, and it seeks to uh, impact and affect and provide opportunities for two to six storey development in, resi in residential areas and some commercial areas. Uh, this plan, as opposed to what I've been talking about, how this council and, and many councils do their work, is a generic approach right across the board. Um, so that's what we'll focus on tonight. The, the, the majority of the presentation will be on that. Uh, but there's also the Todd program, which I can see some folk have already uh, started to ask some questions on the on the QR code there. Uh, the Todd program is, is quite a specific uh, piece of work that is very location specific, and the first part of that uh, will apply to 31 stations around uh, the city metropolitan area, excluding North Sydney Council. I hasten to add, so that won't apply in North Sydney. But there is the what they call the accelerate, accelerated program that will impact on Crow's Nest uh, and that will uh, be rolled out over the next few months. The, the, the Department of Planning tells us that um, by April we'll, 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 we'll commence discussions, consultation, not quite sure what that looks like yet. Uh, and then by November we're told the new planning controls will come into, into being. So that, that's broadly the two streams uh, of, of um, 
change that we'll, we'll discuss tonight. Um, and on that note, I'll, uh, I'll introduce to, uh, to uh, Neil McCarry. Thank you. Thank you, Marcelo, and uh, good evening, everyone, and appreciate you coming along this evening uh, to hopefully uh, learn some more. Um, before I kick off, I just thought I'd throw this map up um, so you can familiarise yourself with um, North Sydney in a map. Planners like looking at maps. So um, this is just firstly what I wanted to speak to in focusing on the low and mid-rise housing um, reforms. Um, so what is proposed to be introduced, and I'll step through them one by one, is the notion of uh, what's called a walking catchment around an 800 metre distance of rail stations. So we've marked in there in red the existing heavy rail and the soon to be opened uh, metro stations. Um, so the 800 metre notion is, is what they call a walking catchment. So that's the actual distance you walk to get to there um, by, by the street pattern. Um, similarly, with the commercial centre, that's the North Sydney CBD, in essence, uh, they're looking at an 800 metre catchment around that. And then they've also introduced uh, a notion of a town centre precincts. So there's a criteria explained in some of the documentation which talks about town centre precincts which are either mixed use or local centres, of which we have, have some, uh, sorry, several, um, and then it talks about uh, but only those centres to which there's a, um, a reasonable level of services and amenities and a, it talks of a mainline supermarket. So we're taking a degree of interpretation. We're not necessarily advocating for it, but in terms of the um, existing commercial and functions uh, of Neutral Bay and Cremorne, we're putting these on the map here, again, just to reiterate, not to necessarily nominate them or support them, but just to say our interpretation of the state government's policy position is that centres of that scale would potentially be included. So the next map I'll show you is when you overlay those three, we'll call them triggers or catalysts or eligibilities for, for change, um, we've come up with a blob. <laughs> um, so this just to explain, the lighter orange is showing you an 800 metre as the crow flies. We have done some walking catchment analysis, but it gets very difficult to demonstrate diagrammatically. So this is indicative, but it's showing you an 800 metre direct line of, uh, of um, travel, sorry, as the crow flies. And then the heavier orange is a 400 metre um, distance, which I will get to the differences between those and their applicability as we move through the, uh, the different um, stages. So um, that's just to introduce the, that notion and the, the government's objectives as stated, and you may have read this, is to essentially um, increase affordability and supply of housing and the mechanisms which they seek to do that. I'm now going to step through. So for those of you, and forgive me if I'll try not to jump into jargon, I know there's lots of people in the room, I recognise a few faces who are quite well informed, but just I'm going to give a quick high level of what zonings are. So council, as Marcelo indicated, has a local environmental plan that establishes a series of, of zonings. So I'm going to focus now on the three main ones in the North Sydney area, being the low density R2 zone, the R3 and the R4. And then in turn, I'll step through and talk about what these changes as we interpret them um, could mean in terms of um, impacts. So just to reiterate, the R2 zone is our, our lowest order zone. It typically contains uh, dwelling houses and we also do allow attached dual occupancies or sometimes referred to as duplex style development. Just got a couple of examples there of that housing form. Um, I also point out before I get into this is the North Sydney uh, planning regime has quite a long and complex history. So there are numerous examples of other forms of housing that were approved some uh, sometime, a long time ago uh, under different um, regimes. But the zoning as it applies today is that light pink is all the R2 low density zone. So the primary planning control in the LEP is a maximum height limit of, of eight and a half metres, and that typically accommodates a two-storey form. Sometimes there's slight exceedances depending on the circumstances. We also make the point that we don't currently rely upon a floor space ratio control. Um, now, that becomes important for reasons I'll get to shortly, but just to try and introduce that concept, and I've got a couple of examples. A floor space ratio is a, a density control which basically dictates the extent or intensity of development that you can have on a site. So 
and that's the sort of the sum of the floor area. So to use an example, um, if someone had a 600 square metre uh, block of land and if there was a floor space ratio control of, of 0.5 to 1, they could potentially accommodate 300 square metres of floor area over those two levels. But I'll, I'll step through a few more examples if, if that can be confusing. So if we overlay now that um, degree of potential change, so that's the orange 800 metres um, crow flies distance, just to point out again with our more detailed analysis that the walking catchment does reduce this slightly um, because of the, the, just the street pattern and layout from those points of change. So as I said, permitted already, dwelling houses and dual occupancies, and it's proposed under this regime to add um, new permissibilities in the form of detached dual occupancies, uh, manor houses, uh, and terrace and townhouse forms. So a manor house, and I've got a few photo examples here, just to step through those, is um, basically a, a two-storey residential flat building may contain sort of three or four um, separate flats within a form that looks and reads a bit like a single dwelling. We don't have a lot of that housing type in, in, the, uh, in North Sydney currently. There are a few examples though. Um, terrace housing, I think you're probably reasonably familiar with, is where there's a direct frontage to the street and townhouses uh, similarly have multiple uh, dwellings sort of on, on the one parcel of land, each with a, with a ground floor, but could be configured in a different arrangement. Um, so accompanying these uh, proposed new housing forms in the low density zone is an increase in the maximum building height of, to up to 9.5 metres. Um, there's a range of floor space ratio provisions for the different types, as well as a range of minimum lot sizes and lot widths for eligibility. Um, so for example, uh, terrace houses could be introduced as a, as a form of housing that you can't currently do. And to be eligible for that, you need an 18 metre um, uh, frontage to the street. And that is accompanied by a 0.7 to one floor space ratio. Um, so that's the main impact as we see it from a, a, a use and a density or scale, um, uh, sorry, the main change in the R2 zone. And just to give you a visual reference, if that was a bit unclear, we've just got a few examples there of some older manor houses um, in High Street, North Sydney, um, some two-storey terrace forms uh, in Crow's Nest there, and three-storey uh, terraces in Neutral Bay, as well as some multi-dwelling housing, just to give you a, a sort of a, a bit of a sense of, of um, what those look like in real terms. Um, I'm now gonna step on to the R3, medium density, um, impacts. Uh, this is a map showing you the existing R3 medium density zones. So currently permitted uh, in those zones, dwelling houses, dual occupancies, um, semi-detached and multi-dwelling housing. And a couple of examples there again. I just draw your point there, uh, your attention there, if your cursor's there. You can see there um, the upper level. So it's a, largely a two-storey form. And in this instance, there's uh, been able to be designed a, a sort of small room in the roof, shall we speak, with a small dormer there. Uh, and that becomes a relevance of relevance with that increase in height limit um, to 9.5 metres. There, there may be potential to accommodate a, what we call a full third storey. But just from a scale and visual perspective, that's some examples of some existing um, housing forms in the medium density zone. So similarly, uh, planning controls currently in place is an eight and a half metre height limit, and there's no current floor space ratio control. Um, so what's proposed? Again, this is the same map showing you those uh, suburb names to get your reference and the medium density zonings, um, current permitted uses, and the big change here is the introduction of residential flat buildings. So residential flat building, I think, is reasonably self-explanatory, but it's a, a block of flats with dwellings located above each other. Um, and accompanying these controls are um, two gradations of scale. So the yellow blobs on the map are showing you a 400 metres as the crow flies from those um, stations and zonings that may trigger um, eligibility. Um, and a building height of 21 metres. So 21 metres is around a six, potentially seven storey scale. And then accompanying that is a maximum floor space ratio provision of three to one. So just to step that through, if someone had a site, a couple of sites, for example, they got together and had a thousand square metres of land area, 
they could potentially accommodate 3,000 square metres of internal floor area. So if each of those units was nominally 100 metres uh, for ease of maths, square metres in area, um, that would potentially be around 30 units in a six to seven storey built form. So just to clarify there, we're looking at the yellow is that catchment and then the, the, the darker pink underneath is those currently zoned R3 zones of uh, parcels of land. So the next um, gradation within this uh, development type is within the four to 800 metre walking catchment. And again, just re-emphasise, these are indicative. They're actually a little bit smaller than I'm showing you on the, on the screen here when you actually do the walking um, distances. And in those areas, um, that catchment, there's a proposed increase up to 16 metres in height. So currently eight and a half, so seven and a half metre increase and a maximum floor space ratio of two to one. So that's, we've talked now about the low density, that's the medium density, and I also move to, now this hasn't been as much the focus of, of a lot of the media reports and attention, but we also have a lot of existing high density zoned land in North Sydney. So these red maps, uh, sorry, parcels here are all our existing, what we call R4 high density residential. Um, so those areas already permit residential flat buildings. A couple of examples there are a newer one at Cremorne and, a, and an older one there at Wollstonecraft. Um, and the vast majority of these sites currently have an only 12 metre height limit. There's a few exceptions. This parcel of land up here is I think 16 metres and there's four or five others that are changing, but broadly that 12 metre height limit accommodates a three to four storey um, scale of development and similarly no floor space ratio control, rather a reliance on things like setbacks, landscaped area, privacy, solar access and those kind of things to, to modulate the built form. So what's proposed in the R4 zone uh, under these reforms is, so again this is the map of the existing R4, within this, we'll call it inner catchment, the height increase would go from 12 metres to 21. So again, that's up to around a six to seven storey form and similarly a floor space ratio of up to three to one. And in the 800 metre, four to 800 metre um, bracket, uh, an increase up to 16 metres and a floor space ratio of two to one. So uh, what does that look like? This is a few examples of some varying uh, scales of residential flat building. Excuse the acronym there, RFB is just residential flat building. So four-storey form there, a five-storey at Crow's Nest. And I've put a couple in there because we, we don't have many in North Sydney. We couldn't find any existing six-storey residential flat buildings. So there's a couple of examples there at Lane Cove and Epping. No particular comment on their, their design quality. It's really just there to give you a sense of the scale of what a six-storey form may, may look like. So moving now through to the mixed use and actual local centres themselves. So this map is showing you that the darker purple is the, the mixed use zoning and the, it's hard to see, but the lighter blue, if my cursor moves there, is up at Camaray, is what's called a local centre. And we have another local centre down at Kirribilli there. So under these provisions, as we interpret them, and it is worded, have to be opened quite vaguely, but our interpretation is that where shop top housing is permitted, so shop top housing is residential flats where they sit above a retail or commercial use at the ground floor level, so it has a definition, but the, the documentation suggests that where that's already permitted and within, um, sorry, where it's already permitted, not to do with the catchments, that there would similarly be an increase up to 21 metres. So most of those mixed use zones uh, currently have a 16 metre height limit, if memory serves. Um, the local centre up here at Camaray has a 13 metre and the Kirribilli uh, centre there, quite small, has an only eight and a half metre. So again, a, quite a degree of change um, that may transpire in those centres themselves. Um, so that's the summary of the low and mid-rise housing changes. I'm going to now try and explain the impact on the transport oriented development. So Marcelo mentioned there the two policy documents there um, as to how they may impact in the future on the crow's nest area. Um, so what I've drawn here is a, and this is identified in the documentation at 1200 metre, so 1 1.2 kilometre radius from crow's nest metro station. 
uh, this area is the subject of a state-led rezoning plan informed by a master plan. And what I'm also showing you on there, if you can make out the slightly darker orange um, underlay or overlay, that area represents, for those of you familiar, the area that was the subject of another state-led strategic planning process, which involved Lane Cove, Willoughby and North Sydney councils, and led ultimately in August 2020 to the finalisation of the St Leonard's Crow's Nest 2036 plan. So that plan has since led, it doesn't, didn't affect the rezoning, but it has guided um, the implementation of several amendments in uh, Crow's Nest area there, particularly along the Pacific Highway, of building scales of 16, 18 and up to 24 storeys. So the status of that as we sit, it's still a plan that's endorsed by the state government. It still um, has been used. In fact, we just got an application two weeks ago for a site on Pacific Highway. Um, is, people are relying on that to achieve a, a change in their planning controls. Um, how this relates and how this process will run, we're um, quite in the dark about. We had a briefing, a uh, very brief briefing in, in late December and were told that there would be some working groups in engagement with council and then a draft plan put out to the community, but their program was very much um, to affect a rezoning of some or a portion of that land or all of it. We, we simply don't know, but the study area is the 1,200 metres and the extent of change, we, we haven't got any information to share and we haven't had any communication since that, that briefing in December. So um, whilst it's called accelerated, uh, it may, we don't know the timing of that, but sorry, the program is looking to affect a rezoning by late this year. And again, similarly, the government's stated objectives are to increase supply and increase affordability. Um, I'll move now, so that's introduced the two main sort of policy um, mechanisms or, or changes. I'll move now just to an important issue, particularly for North Sydney, that most of you are familiar with. Uh, North Sydney Council, rich in, in heritage, uh, 1,100 plus individual heritage items. So this map, it's a little hard to read. The tan or slightly, um, we'll call them tan coloured parcels of land are individual heritage items and they sit within our LEP as well and recognise that status. And we also have 25 heritage conservation areas and the majority of those have been in place since uh, 1989 LEP implementation. So they all, just to talk about the difference between those, uh, and again, I'll, I'll try and keep this as, as simple as I can. An individual heritage item is, a, is a, an item or, or um, we'll use dwelling house as an example, that it has met a, a criteria or threshold such that it, it meets, um, it, it meets, it satisfies a, a criteria, be that aesthetic, historical, social, environmental, whatever that, that, sorry, there is a set criteria such that it's individually listed. Whereas a heritage conservation area is similarly has an historic base, but it's as much around the cohesive or collective sense of place. So you might have individual items within that conservation area, but they're not all necessarily to that standard to be individually listed. And we have a further sub-layer which sits in a, in a control plan, which identifies what's called contributory items. So that means items or houses that contribute to that um, positively, to that heritage character that's desired, um, but, but aren't quite at that threshold or rarity to, to be individually listed. So this is particularly important when we overlay the extent of um, these potential changes as to what that may mean for um, the North Sydney context in, in terms of change. So what we understand, the state government has come out quite strongly uh, to say that these changes will apply in heritage conservation areas and that a merit-based assessment process will continue to apply. So that presents somewhat of a quandary for our assessment planners who will be on the one hand looking at our suite of controls and trying to guide good development in terms of the assessment process such that, for example, someone can achieve a reasonable modification to their house, yet still contribute or not detract from the conservation area. The introduction of a, of a built form, say, to use the example um, of a terrace form, even if it's well designed, will present sort of some fundamental challenges to which we find you know, the, the, the notion of a merit-based assessment really, really challenging to reconcile. The other point I'd just make is um, the majority of our heritage conservation areas uh, are over R2, low density 
zoned land. We have a few small pockets where there's an interface with, um, with the R3. But similarly, again, that scale of development in a conservation area would be challenging. Uh, and then equally up against potentially a, quite a small scale heritage item as well. So um, that's, we, we just flagged that. I think um, it's, it's stating the obvious, but that's a real challenge to how, how that can be reconciled. And there's, there's not a lot of clear policy direction other than that the state government's documentation talks about the council's controls still being considered, but where they're inconsistent, the state controls would overrule them. So to try and capture um, where we're at at the moment, um, as um, was mentioned on Monday night, um, we presented a report to, to council, which is a, a sort of detailed or more technical review of all these changes. Um, and this is just a, a slide to try and sort of give you the, the highlights. Um, the lack of clarity, this, this issue of you know, what happens, for example, if your walking catchment is measured a certain way and it just touches a corner of the block, is that one eligible? You know, what if you cross the road on a diagonal? Like there's a lot of detail that needs to be sorted and there's not an actual draft um, instrument or legislation for us to, to unpack. Um, the eligibility for that town centres concept seems particularly unclear. Um, it talks, as I say, about a mainline supermarket we, you know, there's a lack of certainty of what that even means. Is it 2,000? Is it 3,000 square metre floor area? And um, the degree, a range of services. So that's a, a key one, particularly for the Neutral Bay and Cremorne areas. Um, the one size fits all. These controls for the low and mid-rise housing are proposed to apply across um, all of Sydney and, and Newcastle and Wollongong. So we feel that that fails to take into account the, the local, um, and this isn't unique just to North Sydney, but other other local government areas um, a blanket approach. Um, the infrastructure planning has been mentioned. Um, the built forms, we haven't had um, any testing given to us. So I talked there about the scale and the floor space ratio. So we haven't been given the benefit of any modelling as to how that's been arrived at, but it gives you a sense of the, the, the scale uh, then, and how that would be um, managed. Um, character and amenity issues, I think, are, are fairly obvious. Um, the absence of employment with a growing population, our centres, be they the higher order centres like the CBD or the, the mid-range and lower ones, they have an important role for the community to, to, to work in as well as the services we need day to day. Um, it's really not giving any regard to that. Um, and with respect to transport, the proposal also is accompanied by um, a requirement for certain quantums of parking to be provided for these kind of developments. And council currently has a maximum parking regime so that you can provide some, it's different in different areas, um, but more parking inevitably leads to more traffic congestion. So whether these provisions would um, overrule, sorry, would be in conflict, um, that's another area of concern. So to try and sort of capture that, I've introduced um, the different residential zones and our mixed use zones. This is a bit of a, a compilation, um, and this is available online at a, where you can zoom in as well, um, being the, our zoning maps, if you're wanting to drill down to the in individual site. Um, and these changes, uh, this, this envelope is that layer of all those potential areas of change. Um, so I've spoken about the low and high, medium and high density changes the changes to the centres and the crow's nest um, examination of, into the rezoning pathway. So um, the time frames that we've been indicated is mid this year. So the department is calling for submissions up till the 23rd of February and we, we do have some links at the very end if you're wanting to make a submission, which we'll post at the end of the evening. Um, so mid this year, so 23rd of Feb to to actually then consider those submissions if, if that's the intent and then draft an instrument and resolve that. Um, and the mechanism for doing that is what we understand to be a, a SEP. So that's a state environmental planning policy. So it's a, it's, it reads, I won't say similarly, but it's not dissimilar to our local environmental plan in terms of it being fairly um, technical. Uh, and that would be an amendment that would bring into effect these changes across Sydney. And then the Crow's Nest Station investigations and rezoning, um, the, the program indicated to us is November 2024 for that. So that's a fair bit to digest. Um, I hope it's provided a bit of clarity. There has been a, a lot of reports in the media about how, how other areas are affected. Um, I, I won't confuse the matter, but I would just ask you, ask you to sort of not necessarily take something that's been reported in one LGA, because some of those, particularly the ones um, 
have mentioned around stations have a, have a different actual degree of change and, and mechanism. Um, this is our interpretation of these control these changes proposed and how they apply to North Sydney. So. I hope that's provided some clarity, but I have also um, had a look at, saw a couple of the questions before I came up, and I think there's probably lots more come through um, that I've hopefully answered some of them, but we're now going to move um, to some questions. So uh, I think Marcelo's coming up, and if you haven't been able to operate that QR code, please just raise your hand and we can come around and give you a hand. Um, thank you. I thought... Um as I said, we have a depth of experience and expertise in the strategic planning section of North Sydney that we should be rightly proud of. Um, so I'll start with, um, there's a suite of questions uh, that are probably summarised by um, these questions from Michael Mandel. Is there any real planning supporting this increase in density? Essential services, medical emergency services, schools, open space transport? Um, look, that's been a common criticism of these uh, set of reforms uh, right across local government land. Uh, I'm not aware of any uh, any such investigations. There may have been some, but we're, we've certainly not seen them. Uh, and, and look, every time we talk about growth plans, we talk about change, the number one issue, the number two issue is where is the infrastructure? How is this being supported? Where are our parks? Um, you know, electricity, water, sewerage, these sorts of things, schools, social infrastructure. These are really, really difficult uh, problems to overcome. You may be aware, you may not be aware that the local government actually has uh, its wings clipped in terms of being able to raise funds to, uh, to accommodate uh, new infrastructure. Uh, all councils can raise what we call uh, contributions, developer contributions uh, through the development process. There are some really strict rules around how that's done, how that's able to be done, how that needs to be delivered. Um, but the, 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 the wings being clipped notion is around uh, the state government only allows us to collect a maximum of $20,000 per additional unit. Uh, and that's been the rate for 10 years uh, or so. Uh, hasn't been CPI'd or any of that sort of thing. So when we do the planning and we would do the growth plans, that's something we, we take a lot of care with. Um, I'm not aware of what plans are in place or what investigations have occurred uh, to support these changes. Um, and I can say that Council in its resolution on Monday night resolved that Council put in um, GIPA, that's Government Information Public Access, the old FOI applications to the department so that we can see what modelling, if any, they've done and what were the investigations to come up with the 1.2 uh, kilometre radius and, and the town centre's um, radius. So we, on, be on behalf of the community, are seeking some clarity um, via that process as well. Um, the next one is um, repeated a number of times and uh, it sums it up in particular relation to the Holtman Estate. Um, someone has asked Holtman Estate, and I think you could say heritage conservation areas more generally, what will happen? Is heritage dead? Uh, yeah, look, that's a good question and that's uh, something that we uh, looked at very closely when this was uh, delivered to us in mid-December, uh, when people, before people went on leave and things. But um, I think what, what may be saving, in inverted commas, the, the Holterman Estate and other similar areas is the, the allotment sizes and the configuration. They're very, very narrow blocks. They're very small blocks. Um, and the extent of change, because it's an R2 zone, the, the lowest density zone, uh, the rate of, uh, so what's proposed there is an increase in height of one metre uh, and the permissibility of terrace homes um, and, that's the, um, and that sort of median density type home. But anyone wanting to do that development will need to compile quite a number of allotments side by side so that there, there is an economic question about how much investment will be required to, to, to return um, uh, you know, uh, a, a dollar in, in, in that circumstance. So uh, I don't think uh, her heritage is dead necessarily. And in that particular instance, it, it may be the allotment size that, um, that kind of represents that nothing too much will happen. Because today, for example, dual occupancy development is permissible uh, in that estate and other um, uh, heritage conservation areas, but it hasn't been taken up. 
Uh, this brings it up a notch, but it, it's an economic question, uh, which can change over time, of course, as well. Uh, so, look, I hope that answers the question. So, yes, more uh, capacity and more development potential as a result of these processes, but very narrow allotments, which, which may create a real uh, handbrake on, on development in future. Um, from the elected level, I'll say that, to me, one of the worst impacts of this is the impact on places like the Holtzman Estate. Um, this is a really radical change in that it's effectively wiping out the Heritage Act um, basis without really any community consultation. And it's not just the Holtzman Estate because these apply from Newcastle through to Wollongong and everywhere in between. Um, and it's certainly something that um, we've put to the Minister and we'll continue to put to the Minister and also to the Minister for Environment and Heritage. Um, and, and on that basis, which is there's a furphy that somehow heritage is one, a handbrake on any form of redevelopment, which is untrue. It's not a prohibition. You have to meet certain requirements under each under the local environmental plan. Um, and two, what we know is that some of our most highly dense suburbs in North Sydney are heritage conservation areas. There are very small lot sizes. You see the form that's being encouraged, terraces. Um, and so we think that, that they actually meet the criteria of density done well. I think, if I could just add to that, I think that's a really good point. The, because some of these uh, heritage conservation areas uh, comprise detached dwellings, in fact, they're quite, uh, they're quite high density uh, because they sit side by side and they're often one or two storeys. Uh, if you do the, the maths on these, uh, it's actually resulting in a much higher density, certainly a much higher density than a quarter acre block or even higher density than that. So I think there's a misnomer that uh, some of these heritage conservation areas are low density. They're, they're actually not low density at all. Um, this is a question repeated at least eight times in various different forms from you all, is there any likelihood of increased green space to serve the increased population? Um, I think I can answer that as a, your elected member. Um, we've had that battle ongoing over the um, what was an urban activation precinct in Crowsnest St Leonard's. Uh, and when the 2036 plan came out, there was some some special infrastructure contributions set aside for increasing open space in order to meet that 6,600 odd new population. Before um, the minister announced these reforms, he abolished the special infrastructure contribution and those funds will go into consolidated revenue to be used across Greater Sydney. For the transport oriented development process as it sits around the metro at Crow's Nest, they have $520 million in this year's budget to increase amenity, including works for open space, um, raising, um, increasing capacity on local roads surrounding eight of the metro sites. Uh, if you were to do a crude back of the envelope uh, division, uh, eight into 520 would be less than what had already been allocated for open space under the 2036 plan. I think this is the, the real nub of it. Um, we know that it's important to have uh, community infrastructure and particularly open space uh, um, either come before or at least in concert with new development. Um, and that's why um, the council now policy position is that uh, local-based planning with communities uh, that can allow for us to plan for the capacity to acquire land for new open space is, is the way that we ensure that it's delivered. But I think the short answer is in these reforms, no. Um, and I'd urge you to read that explanation of intended effect because what we haven't looked at tonight are environmental impacts, um, particularly urban tree canopy. Um, all that's required is a diminution in the, in the standards that exist currently. So three, for every 350 square metre lot, all that these are requiring is one tree. So um, there are some there are some real impacts on open space and also urban canopy. Can I just add to that on the uh, the, the tree canopy? Um, with that assignment of of a height, like if we anticipate there'll be a greater take up in the R three zone, the medium density zone, I mentioned that some of those areas have a three to one FSR accompanying that. Um, 
that will drive a, a, a bulkier building, which we our internal testing, I think, is is too much on, on a height of that. So if someone's not going to exceed the height and they're wanting to sell that floor space, that will push the buildings out and, um, as Mayor Baker mentioned there, reduce the area available to, to plant those trees. So we have uh, urban forest tree canopy targets and, and this may challenge our ability to, to try and meet those, in fact, erode them. Um, this is also a few questions on this. Will there be any specific provisions for key worker housing and or social housing in the planning? Um, in the, uh, the the Todd program, so that's the master planning exercise around a crow's nest, there is mention in that of uh, an aim to provide 15% affordable housing. So affordable housing is, yes, key worker accommodation is, is probably a more accurate description, um, but we don't know the, the mechanism or what further increases in height may be needed to, to deliver that. Um, I think that was mentioned, Marcelo, in the broader changes uh, in the the other precincts, not in North Sydney, of a, of a 2% requirement, but again, a 2% contribution. So whether that's a monetary contribution to go to a community housing provider or not, we're, we're unsure, but there was a mention outside the crow's nest of those other precincts outside North Sydney of only 2%. So that's how we've interpreted it. Yeah, and I think the wider narrative, so that, that's a very uh, confined precinct and there's eight of those around um, around Sydney. In the wider suite of changes that will affect the, the, the broad, broader parts of, of Sydney, I think the, the, the state government's narrative is that if we increase supply, we will improve affordability. Now, I'm not sure that that's going to be the case. Uh, it's, not, it's, not a, it's a fairly kind of broad approach that, um, you know, we have... There are various uh, precincts around, not, not just in North Sydney, but other parts of Sydney where there's been a, a big... Um, uh, 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 number of, of dwellings and apartments delivered in a short space of time, which hasn't improved affordability at all. So that, that, the jury's still out on, on, that, on that narrative. Um, has council received any planning logic regarding the 1200 metre radius around Crow's Nest Metro Station? Uh, not yet. Um, so we've had, as Neil pointed out, we had uh, one meeting with the, the Department of Planning deep into December um, where this broad uh, planning reform was, was discussed in, in general terms uh, with a commitment to meet and work through uh, some changes. Uh, we've not, we don't even have an invitation yet for a meeting, so, uh, so the answer is no. Um, I can add to that from the elected level, just... In the lead up to Christmas, I met with Minister Paul Scully and I asked outright, was it anything more than just a crude um, compass around the metro station? Um, he didn't quite answer that, but he did say that there would be room for negotiation about where it would actually apply. Um, because I pointed out that if you used the 1.2 kilometres, it would stretch from parts of Camaray down to the end of Wollstonecroft. Um, since then, Council Laws attended a briefing with the deputy, with the departmental secretary and a number of senior planners from the department. We again put that to them, whether we can hold them to this. One of the planners informed the councillors that uh, that. Given the timeframes, um, being April um, to, to have a draft and finalised by November, that's for those eight metro sites, that they would start, they thought, with, with the um, 2036 plan area. Um, again, it's not clear and it's certainly not what they're display what's on public exhibition. Um, another question is, how will the conservation and character of key areas and surrounds such as McMahon's Point and Lavender Bay within the 400 metres of North Sydney be safeguarded? So this is, this is where the rubber hits the road, where new planning controls will be uh, superimposed on council's planning control. So the, what Neil described as an amendment to the state planning policy, the SEP, uh, we think will be a couple of fairly crude changes by increasing height and increasing floor space ratio. What Neil didn't go into any detail about is that there will be the introduction, we think, of what they call uh, non-refusal standards. 
So things like, for example, a 21 metre height limit, if a building, if a proposal complies with a 21 metre height limit, the council will still assess the application, but it won't have the capacity to refuse that application solely based on height and the, the impacts of that height. Uh, and that will apply to the floor space ratio as well. So the challenge will be how do we then apply our own planning controls, which would generally be premised on a, on a much lower height, uh, for example, standard, um, and ha how do we reconcile those two very differing approaches? Uh, we don't know, uh, but we will, we will have the responsibility of assessing those applications on, in this example of a 21 metre height limit, based on that 21 metre height limit. It, it will be a very challenging exercise. Um, the next question is, is there information on proposed separation of buildings and setbacks within these R2 and R3 zones? In other words, how much space between buildings? Um, on the lower density provisions, um, there's at the moment what's published um, minimum requirements in terms of uh, lot widths and lot areas uh, and heights. And then there's a reference to the, the council's controls applying. But again, to use that floor space argument as a driver, um, we don't know what that, what, what they'll be, how, they'll, how far they'll be challenged. So um, we've got other regulations like the Building Code of Australia and in the higher density forms, the SEP um, 65 um, Department Design Guide, which is a sort of statewide um, uh, Sydney-wide at least, uh, tool that helps guide good design. So there's reference in that and in fact it talks about relaxing some of the requirements in that state government's own existing design guide for the six-storey form. So um, again, challenging is it maybe trying to be polite about it, but difficult. Are new traffic studies planned to be undertaken incorporating new Western Harbour Tunnel traffic off-ramping and increased population density? No. <laughs> um, there are many four and five storey unit blocks in North Sydney, many within 400 metres of the metro. Is it likely that zoning will be expanded and they could become 16 to 20 storeys plus? It was generally, I mean, there's two, I, I would say it's Crow's Nest, but, but, there, but there are also within the McLaren Street portal, yeah. Sure. Um, look, we, we we do have existing housing stock of a, you know, that sort of scale as described. So these changes, the economics of them may, may mean that those stay exactly as is. So it sometimes won't make a lot of sense to, to knock down, um, you know, a 12 unit development to build a 16 or 18 unit development. It just simply wouldn't stack up. But there are in those same zones some, some lower slung sort of uh, historic, you know, two or two and a half storey type uh, residential flat buildings, maybe with only six or eight apartments where we have seen a bit of a trend of late where um, under these slight increases uh, with the new strata laws where only three quarters of the strata need to agree to a sale um, that they could turn over and we've seen a bit of a trend where there's a, a demand for like a high-end larger apartment. So you may get uh, a degree of change, an increase in height, but no significant net increase in actual dwelling numbers on a site. So I'm speculating here, but we're just sort of trying to look at the existing trends, look at the existing stock and, and try to make our best estimate on the degree of change. But um, yeah, difficult to say, but under these controls, they're not suggesting outside of the crow's nest investigation, any anything of that scale. Um, there's at least three questions that basically come down to this. How does the council have any input in new developments where decisions are made at state level? Um, I think the answer to this is what's proposed is to over thoroughly override local planning controls. Um, so already um, council's decision making on larger scale development has been transferred to regional planning panels. Um, the uh, this is another layer um, that just does not respond to our particular place um, and circumstances. Yeah, um, and look, I might just add to that, at the risk of being slightly controversial, that these changes were were proposed and, and, and put on public exhibition in, as I say, deep into December. I can't remember the, the date exactly, but if this council 
was to put anything of significance on public exhibition for comment during that time would be quite rightly roasted. Um, so it's, um, you know, it's, it's uh, I think, an exercise in, in trying to, to get change to happen fairly quickly in the context of a housing emergency. Um, as we've said right throughout this presentation, this council has demonstrated how one can increase housing capacity in a consultative, uh, thoughtful manner. It takes a little longer, uh, but we uh, we kind of uh, continue to, uh, to to advocate for that position. Um, another question is, what are the community benefits arising from the major uplift in density in Crow's Nest? And I, I, I'll answer that as an elected person, there aren't. The planned community benefits around that increase in density in Crow's Nest either came from council's own planning with the community um, and the first stage of Hume Street Park was an example of that. But a, successive of, a succession of changes um, prior to even these announced changes, but particularly the rollback of the special infrastructure contribution um, has meant that the mechanism that we have used to plan to al allow for additional open space and community facilities has effectively been taken from us. And so the density um, will prevail, um, but there is no um, lever for us as a council and community to secure any additional contributions to provide for particularly open space. Yeah, and I might just add to that, open space is particularly challenging because land is just so expensive in Sydney, as we all know, and, and particularly in, in parts of Crow's Nest and areas around stations. So actually buying land to create new open space is really, really challenging. So we've got to make whatever land we have work really hard. Uh, and you will have seen some uh, some proposals to, to make that land work hard around uh, the Hume Street Park, for example, the Holterman car park uh, and other places where there's a multitude of things happening. Uh, but that's very expensive as well. You save on land acquisition, uh, but you spend very big on, on new infrastructure, including excavation and, and other fairly uh, expensive uh, infrastructure. Um, and that's also in a context, as we all know, in which at least 1.5 hectares of Camaray Park will permanently go for the... Um, Western Harbour Tunnel Warringah Freeway upgrade. So not only do we already know we have the least amount of public open space per person per square kilometre in this um, local government area, but it's diminishing by major state projects. Um, and that, when you think about that loss of public open space in the context of what's planned in places like Camaray and North Camorne, um, it will actually have um, less per head of population than we currently do. Um, what, con what consideration is being given to existing underutilised commercial buildings in the CBD being converted to residential slash part residential apartments? I'll, I'll answer that one. Um, so North Sydney Council's policy position for a long period of time has been to not allow residential development in the commercial centre. Um, particularly amplified by the uh, oncoming of Metro, it serves a really important jobs function. Uh, we're identified as being part of the Eastern Harbour CBD. So that is, even though there's a bit of water in between, we're, as a, as a planning sort of hierarchy, part of that CBD. Um, so the state government in mid to late last year introduced um, some provisions uh, that basically allowed via another pathway, um, what's called a state significant development pathway where you could look to provide what's called build to rent accommodation. So that is convert um, or rebuild um, commercial build, in the commercial zone, a, a build to rent um, apartment. So we've had a notification of two such applications in the North Sydney uh, Centre and, and potential murmurings of another one or two. So um, whilst that looks a, you know, an, an, avenue, an avenue to perhaps provide some housing in a well-located area, it, it needs really careful consideration in, in our opinion uh, in terms of the function of, of our employment centres that are intended to serve a growing population. So that is in place uh, currently, that provision. Um, at the, there's a series of questions that say, at the end of the day, can council override the government's decision? Um, and that's also with a set of questions that ask, can those, can these, um, these reforms be challenged in court? 
Um, at the moment, it's the, I'll ta uh, my my take on it is at the moment it's very one no councils can't override state planning. Um, we're, no, local councils are creatures of the state. We are under an act that the, of the state government, um, and it's very clear in the current planning regime that state um, policies trump local. Um, in terms of a legal challenge, well, part, the, the most radical of the changes proposed, in my view, are the low to mid-rise, um, mostly because they are just a blanket across um, the, a lot of the east coast of um, our large metropolitan areas. Um, it, they, haven't, they haven't exhibited a planning instrument um, and um, you can challenge uh, a minister on a, on a technical administrative law that they haven't consulted. Well, clearly they're consulting. We might not like the timeframes, but they are. Um, whether there's a technical defect ultimately in the policy when it's once it's made, um, that's a matter for legal advice and councils to consider. But what I would say is, despite a really horrible binary um, narrative going on that this is nimby yimby, one generation against the next, leafy suburbs versus Western Sydney. What you're finding is pretty much a, com a communal voice from local government. So whether it's from from um, the city of Sydney, the hills, uh, Fairfield, uh, Inner West, North Sydney, and everywhere in between, and that's because um, most um, there are there. Local government has a surfeit of really fantastic planners and communities used to engaging in planning. And this goes against the good principles of good planning. Um, and I find it interesting that last September, the Greater Cities Commission was about to issue draft housing targets for every Greater Sydney Council. Um, we would have been, if, if the state government had just said, right, here's your housing target, North Sydney, you've got six months to do it. We would be part way, th we wouldn't have, it would have been difficult, we might not have liked it, but we would have been part way through a re response that was tailored for our community with our community. Um, so, um, and, and the last thing I'll say is in terms of, the, one of the terrible things about this is in terms of, there won't be any modelling about capacity. We know for the St Leonard's growth area that Sydney water on our existing up zoning under planning proposals under the 2036 plan uh, have in writing informed the regional planning panel that there is limited capacity for water and sewerage in the St Leonard's growth area. And that's, that's where one of these reforms is targeted at the um, Crow's Nest Metro 1.2 kilometres. So I put that to the Minister for Planning um, and the reality about that is um, that is going to be one of the issues that we have to negotiate strongly with with the state government because um, that, that those old utilities in an, in an established area like North Sydney, it's not just water, it's electricity. Um, there are places in Crow's Nest that have intermittent um, service. So the, that underlying um, work I, I don't think has been done and we won't be alone in explaining that to the state government. Um, will... Th uh, there's one, there are a couple specific around Crow's Nest. So will the third eye site above the metro apply for more height and affordable housing now? Um, they're, they're actually proposing affordable housing more than what the state government's requiring in the precinct. Um, so I suppose... Yeah, look, I might just say to that, that there is another planning uh, initiative that was announced <clears throat> about three months ago or so to, to increase the stock of affordable housing by increasing uh, height uh, capacity across the board for, for certain development. Um, and we know that some of you, or the person that asked that question will probably be aware of the, the five-way site, as it's affectionately known, uh, in Crow's Nest. Uh, and they've got in a current, uh, there's a, an approach, I'm not sure if it's an application, it's an approach, the early stages of an application seeking to take advantage of that 30% additional height, which uh, takes the total height to so the, the recent amendment to that site was 58 metres uh, assigned and this proposal as we've had it described is 76 metres. So that's on top of what's the height that's already been assigned 
under that mechanism to give a bonus for provision of affordable housing. Are there any clear... Sorry, can you translate that to story? Uh, sure, roughly. Are there 58 metre high building was premised on a reference design of around 16 storeys. Um, I think this represents at least another six on top of that approved height. Uh, are there any clear environmental standards for new developments under these reform, for example, insulation solar panels? There's, there's no changes. There's currently um, a mechanism called BASICS you may be f familiar with, which sets uh, energy and resource consumption targets for different housing types. Um, these would still all continue to apply. That tool is under review as uh, technology and advancements in things have improved. So, but yeah, under this, there's no um, nothing additional uh, that we've been able to read uh, out of it. Um, there's, a, there's a series of questions that are really about community campaigns and what, what is council prepared to fight and what will, what will council um, be doing. Um, so I think I should answer that. Uh, council resolved to strongly object on a series of grounds um, and have um, resolved to prepare a submission. That submission, uh, that happened on Monday night the first council of the meeting of the year. Um, but we were conscious that community information events like this um, would be taking place after that. So that submission is to be informed by the substance of any um, submissions received from residents. Uh, if you um, look at this QR code, if you take that, that takes you... In the next one, sorry. <laughs> This, this, this um, QR code takes you to the Department of Planning so that you can have your say. Um, council's submission will be uh, published, um, made public so that um, you can be informed by that if you wish to be. Um, I would urge you to think about what you've heard tonight, inform yourself and make your own submissions. Uh, in terms of the advocacy, uh, we are continuing on your behalf to make the case directly to the Minister for Planning, the Premier, um, to all of the crossbenchers and uh, minor um, shadow, shadow cabinet and minor parties, and we will continue to do that. Um, we are part of the Northern Sydney Regional Organisation of Councils, and there's a special meeting tomorrow night to talk about it from a regional um, perspective. Uh, and given the timeframes, the focus to date has been on understanding what these reform means for North Sydney and um, continuing with that advocacy to the state government. Um, I would say make certain that you also copy um, any submission you make to the crossbenchers. I've been to meet with Michael Regan, who was the former mayor of Northern Beaches Council, and with Alex Greenwich, and I'll be meeting with the shadow uh, minister for planning and other crossbenchers. I think it's um, really important to uh, to use every decision maker available, and certainly I think those crossbenchers will have a place to play in negotiating some reasonable uh, amendments to these uh, proposed changes, particularly as it relates to heritage areas um, and uh, particularly as it uh, relates to that one size fit all, fits all position. Um, that, that really does bring us close to the end of um, this information session. It will be, it has been filmed. It will be on council's website and other media, digital media platforms, hopefully by Friday, um, but certainly not long after that, so that you can look at it again. Um, there will be these, the documents you've seen will be on council's website so that you can um, make yourself familiar with it and think about it again. Thank you all for your attendance tonight. Thank you for your participation and interest um, and this conversation that we'll be engaged in, not just us, but pretty much every council between and community between Newcastle and Wollongong um, uh, will be part of that conversation in the coming months. Thank you. <laughs>